thank you everyone for joining again. I'm super excited um, for another keynote meeting uh, of our health extension um, uh, group sponsored by 100 plus capital. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it's really nice to see so many of you. Um, I think uh, just as a brief announcement, you will be getting a lot more emails for scheduling a lot more meetings because a lot more meetings have been proposed. Um, if you can't make uh, individual bonus meetings that's totally fine those keynote meetings here uh, really are the ones um that uh, that we would love everyone here for so for this one i think in particular i'm super excited uh, to welcome ronald kohansky uh, from the nia for a meeting that many of you have been looking forward to for a really long time uh, and that has also been in the planning for a really long time and uh, ronald has been promoted to the acting director of the division of aging biology at the national institute uh, on aging from the nih and we're in incredibly honored, I think, to have him today and present to us a little bit. And I know he's laughing. You have to take it. I will introduce it like this. And, and uh, I, I, we're really excited to have him first present on the NIA uh, and then uh, answer your questions. And I think he wants to make that quite an open session starting, um, starting after his presentation. So we're really looking forward to a really broad discussion. Um, and uh, Nia unmuted himself already. Do you have something to say <laughs> even before the presentation starts? <laughs> I, I, love, I love seeing Ron when he's awake. That's all, you know, uh, always a pleasure. <laughs> all right, Ron. Well, no pressure on you then. And I think, um, yeah, without further ado, um, I'm, we're super, super happy for your presentation. I will share um, um, the uh, more of your bio and background in the chat to not take further time away from you and I'll be admitting uh, more people as they join. Really, really, really excited to have you here and I'm looking forward to this meeting very much. All right. Uh, thank you, Alison, and uh, good morning, Nir. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I'm going to treat this actually as, as um, something of a therapy session. I'm going to tell you what's bothering me and then you can sit there and say, mm -hmm, that's interesting, how do you feel? But um, what the way I feel about this is biology of aging is, has literally come of age over the last 30 years. Uh, the Division of Aging Biology um, put this topic on the map really through a series of requests for applications and funding of applications that was done by Dr. Anna McCormick when she was here. And, um, it was on longevity assurance genes, and it helped to people to understand that there is a molecular basis for what was then a, a relatively obscure um, uh, topic, which is what is aging uh, and how does it happen? So I hope you can see the slides um, and I'll just jump right in. Uh, also, oh, thank you for the invitation and uh, for your forbearance in listening to this presentation. So, um, I mean, let me just begin with a little perspective, uh, which is that uh, living is what we all do um, as long as we can. And it's pretty much what you do day to day. And at least when you're um, a young person, you expect to increase your capacity and your uh, activities and your abilities. And as an adult, you'd like to maintain a certain level of activity. And this is all related to some indices of health. And in fact, what you can do day to day uh, would indicate good health as long as you maintain it. But when you have aging, your activities are harder to do, certainly year to year. And you also do expect them to diminish, even though these are indices of health. So one of the questions becomes, in the face of diminishing capacity, are you still healthy? And uh, the answer is actually yes, but the question is, how do we understand that? How do we better maintain it? And for those whose health is declining a little bit more rapidly than would like, um, how do we ameliorate that? So one of the things that we talk about frequently is the rate of aging. Um, and it's something that we think we know what we mean, um, but it's not necessarily so obvious uh, what the metrics are. And I'll go into why I think that. Uh, although there are multiple metrics. Um, and I'm proud to say that the NIA has supported quite a few of those studies. So aging uh, encompasses, as mentioned, a decline of function and also an increase in uh, risk for disease. It's basically the geroscience hypothesis 
that, uh, or the foundation for geroscience is that aging is this major risk factor. And if we could slow the rate of aging, we could uh, decrease the severity of disease and delay its onset. But it also has to do with function. So walking speed is a very good indicator of um, expectation of mortality, actually. Uh, and walking speed diminishes with age. It doesn't really decrease in a linear fashion. Actually, it accelerates a bit as one goes from one decade to the next. Uh, it also, there's a, a rise, of course, as function is acquired, counterbalanced by the uh, loss of underlying uh, capability. But a lot goes into walking. It's a complex uh, activity, uh, even if not chewing gum at the same time, because it involves muscle strength, it involves uh, bone quality, joint quality, uh, speed of neuronal conduction, perception, balance, a great many things go into walking. And all of those parameters are and can be analyzed pretty well. Um, and a major uh, disease that is associated with age, and certainly the increase uh, with age, uh, is cancer, all sorts of cancers. And these are data taken from the NCI website, um, where the age of diagnosis uh, is shown here, and the disease prevalence per 100,000 is shown here. And this is an exponential increase. So there are a lot of clocks, of course, for aging. The, um, early on uh, in 2013, um, Hanum, in collaboration with Eidecker and Zhang, uh, came up with an epigenetic clock, uh, along with Steve Horvath and Morgan Levine, entirely separate work, uh, but basically looking uh, for an elastic net linear fit to uh, a set of uh, methylations on DNA uh, and using elastic net, of course, you're going to get a linear outcome. And the question is, what is your methylome age, as it were, related to your phonological age or time since birth? And it is interpreted as saying that those who have methylation ages above the av uh, average set are aging faster, and those who are below the average set are aging slower. And it looks like the evidence is um, supporting that in a lot of cases. And methylation age can be determined from tissues, uh, and all the constraints of those are uh, becoming better known and better understood. And there are a lot of methylation clocks at this point. And they cross a lot of species. But the, one of the problems is, though, that the methylation age is linear, and the risk, the appearance of the risk, anyway, is not. So um, it's exponential in terms of disease, and it has some type of, lo of loss when it comes, or shape when it comes to loss of function. So here's the methylation clock. It's linear. Um, if you looked at risk or prevalence from a single factor, it would be linear. But if you had two factors interacting, as we know from uh, uh, cancer and many other diseases where there's an environmental in influence interacting with a genetic factor, you'll get a nonlinear behavior. And if you have three factors that are interacting, it begins to look like an exponential change. So it's not quite clear how one relates this to the, to the actual appearance of the disease and therefore the, understand the risk. But um, it's likely that thing that whatever the metrics are for aging, the methylation clock, if it's causal, is interacting with at least one other factor. So the other thing about uh, the lack of linearity in some features of aging comes from the work of uh, Tony Wiskere and Nir Barzilai um, in a paper where La Haye was the uh, lead author. And they looked at um, roughly 3,000 proteins uh, in plasma. And they found that there are changes and there are basically three peaks of change in these aging proteins uh, occurring early, uh, late midlife and in old age. So what kind of clock represents this pattern of aging is not yet clear. Then we get on to the question of health span which is the period of life that's free of disease. That's the accepted definition. So here 
would be prevalence of disease in human populations uh, from some data uh, compiled in 2014 and earlier. And this is the period of life that's where most of the population you could say would be free of disease. So uh, health span would seem to come to an end by the time you reach midlife, which is depressing. But there may be other ways to look at this. The term health span, at least in the point of view of uh, NIA, became prominent because the metric we had been using for 15 years was lifespan. But we were pivoting toward health. And so health span became a, a natural, uh, not necessarily neologism, but a, 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 the term that we went to. But when you get out to these older ages, you have multimorbidities. And um, I'm not going to steal any thunder from, from near by any means, but by pointing out that this is an area where the TAME trial uh, becomes extremely important. Um, and we're hoping to see that uh, results from that uh, in the not too distant future, but of course it's, it would take five years from the time it starts. So here's a question, starting to put some things together. So you have the how do you relate all of these changes that you can detect in the um, plasma proteome or the methylome or uh, metabolome or almost any other way of looking at uh, molecular changes across uh, age? How could you relate this to the prevalence of disease? Which of these 3,000 proteins, if any, are risk factors for any of these conditions? That's a challenge. Um, and that's the challenge for geroscience to unravel. So there's another way of looking at it, uh, which is an, a term already in use in, uh, in um, insurance companies, and that's health expectancy, right? They come in and if you get met by an insurance agent at home, they'll come in, draw some blood, take some information, go back uh, with that information, try to determine what's your next likely disease and how healthy are you going to be and how much should they charge you? Um, so they don't just bin by your chronological age, they also bin by some of your health metrics. So there is a, an expectation of what your health is going to look like in the not too distant future. And I think something like that might actually be useful uh, when it comes to geroscience. So it's biology or physiology over time. That's what we're asking for when it comes to health expectancy. Either you look at your recent trajectory or you take a single time point and then relative to other known trajectories or uh, collections of time points, you ask, how will this person compare relative to the rest of the population? So there are lots of ways of looking at biology over time. Um, there's fetal development, which, um, it, but the Ballard score actually applies to people, but you get the same concept when it looks uh, at mouse development in embryos or embryonic development in Drosophila or in zebrafish or almost anything out there that goes through an embryonic phase. Uh, so you have a set of scores where you can look at parameters and you can tell where you are relative in the course of development. And you can also tell where things are not going well. You can find the outliers in any of these uh, organs if they do not fit a, a specific pattern. So things, generally speaking, go in concert, but not always. And in fact, for mammals, approximately 40% of this process fails. It's not really 100% efficient, not even close. So the failures can occur in all sorts of places. Of course, a birth can happen where some failures along the way have taken place, but they aren't severe enough to abort the process. Then there's health at birth, which is the APGAR score. These five parameters named actually, it's a reverse acronym. Virginia APGAR was the person who came up with this, an anesthesiologist at Columbia University. And this is a way of assessing a healthy baby with a score from zero which uh, means inactive, no respiration, et cetera, um, but can be treated uh, or all the way up to 10 where things look uh, pretty good. So there's a score at birth. 
There's also the transition from uh, being a baby to being a teenager. Um, and there are sets of scales for what is going on during maturation and puberty, the Tanner scales. And these all have scores as well. And you can tell uh, because of the multiple components, how well a person is doing in terms of their maturation, the development of those capacities that will allow them to uh, do their daily activities, including uh, reproduction. And uh, there are multiple components. So you can find out if things are in synchrony or have they become dyssynchronous. And you can also see in shifts in populations, effects of environmental influences as um, the, the uh, let's say the onset of menarche, for example, has shifted to earlier ages, uh, probably due to environmental influences. And we also know that um, what constitutes health during child development, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, has these charts that uh, anybody can follow. You can fill them in at home with your own child. And basically what happens here is that you have uh, deciles of um, condition, height and weight at birth. And pretty much if you stay in your lane, you're healthy. So a person who's uh, light and short will be healthy staying there. And a person who is um, taller and heavier will also be healthy if they continue along that pattern. But if you break across lanes, there is then some indication of an unhealthy condition. And it's pretty um, simple. And as to what it is, there are, there's a long history, of course, of uh, pediatric analysis. So it's possible to identify what the problems are. Uh, and um, in many cases, there are reasonable solutions that can be used. So what do you have for aging? S assuming from my point of view, aging is an adult process. Um, it could begin earlier. Uh, it's subject to debate, but I would draw your attention to work that's emerging from Vadim Gladyshev's lab on that topic, which is quite interesting, um, but come to that at another time. So you could have an aging score, and if you can figure out what it is, you get your name there. And you have various components. You have physiology, which could be viewed as uh, resilience or frailty. There are a lot of frailty indices out there, which some of which are on, based on function, some of which are based on molecular characteristics or clinical characteristics, and some which combine these. And then there are extrinsic risks, uh, which affect uh, age and will, of course, affect health at age. And then um, I'm not going to develop it in today's talk, but there is a viewpoint that the minimum unit of um, a biological system is two interacting uh, components in a feedback loop or some form of feedback loop in a network. Because in those situations, if you change one, you change both and those results um, spread through a network. So it wouldn't be just one node, it would be interacting nodes, but could debate that on another time. But one, one of the two things that, ha that happens here when you look at these uh, health expectancy space would be what kinds of outcomes are you going to predict? So are you going to predict time to death? That's um, very important and very useful. Um, it can be disconcerting to be told, but that's an ethical question beyond my scope. But there's also the question of what do you expect for your health? Will it, what, not necessarily what's your next disease, but what is your expectation for continued function uh, to the best that could be maintained? And that best is, again, soft term. So the next thing is intervention. So you have some score or some way of assessing health, um, and you want to develop interventions, as you do, and which is one of the reasons that I listen to this group is to try to get some idea of your ideas about in, um, what interventions might be there um, and how one goes about screening for interventions and how you score interventions. But aging is an inherently heterogeneous process, so it's a little bit difficult. So here's one way of looking at it, once again, from uh, the Kladyshev lab. Uh, this is taking uh, interventions that affect lifespan. And in almost all cases, I actually can't think of an exception, 
when um, in the intervention testing program that NIA supports and also in other research that's done outside of that purview, taking laboratory mice, whether inbred strain or the heterogeneous mice used in the intervention testing program, if you extend lifespan, the older mice tend to look healthier than the control mice. And what uh, Gladyshev and, and Miller, I was, think Miller might have been on this, but in any case, what the Gladyshev group did was they, they took the uh, liver from these and they looked at gene expression signatures in the liver. Uh, they also looked at other tissues, but shown here is for liver. These are a range of interventions, which can, um, by clustering, uh, you can see that some of them clearly have more in common than others. Uh, some just don't seem to have much in common with any of them. So you can map these uh, through computer tools to a network. And you can see that there are a range of um, uh, here. These are uh, growth hormone receptor knockout, little mice, AIMS, Snell, and FGF21. These are all genetically modified mice that have extended lifespans. There are also some uh, chemical interventions uh, that were tested. And there's also caloric restriction, um, which is pretty well established that it works in uh, all, if not most, most if not all laboratory mice, some question about that. Um, but rapamycin is an outlier. So you can find uh, signatures from the livers. This is, these livers, I believe, were taken before the, uh, or somewhere near the breakover point in the curve. So they indicate, uh, in a sense, uh, future performance um, following the intervention. So um, this is the proposal here is intriguing because the question is if you can use this as a screen for an intervention, um, which would extend based on extension of lifespan, might you then have an intervention that would improve health? So then we get to the other thing, which of course is, well, um, it's not really about mice, it's about people. So if you look at relative age, often referred to as biological age or physiological age, but let's say relative age, um, that is within a, a group of people at one age, as in the Dunedin study, um, and this is uh, a quick representation of the kind of study they, they do by uh, Belsky and Terry Moffat and um, Caspi and others. So it's a study of about a thousand people who keep coming back year over year. They've been followed since birth. I think they're 45 now. Uh, and they come back from all over the world to spend time uh, in this program. Uh, although they were all born in New Zealand. So what you get here is what you expect that for any population, there's going to be some average set of characteristics, whatever they are, there are 19 biomarkers used and you get an aggregate score and you can say there are people who seem to be aging slowly and people who seem to be aging quickly relative to the average. And in fact, um, Terry Moffat and others in, the pro in this program have shown pictures of people who are, let's say by these metrics uh, with the standard doctor's visit data, standard dentist visit data and pulmonary metrics, which is not exactly standard, but it's not a big deal to go through this. It takes about an hour, I think. Um, you, can, you can take the faces of these people and make an aggregate using uh, computer assistance. And the people who by these metrics are aging faster look older. And the people who are aging slower actually look younger, um, males and females. So it's a remarkable piece of work. So this is the, why is this a starting concept for intervention? is that if you look at a population, so let's say you're gonna do a study for 20 years of an intervention, you have some biomarker score, you have some people who look younger and some people who look older. If you knew who they, well, using this image, facial image, you might be able to stratify the population and you might suspect that the people who look older would benefit more from the intervention. So if you use the whole population and took averages, how much will that average shift? perhaps not that much relative to your reference population, which is the 70 year olds you have at the same time you start the intervention. So what you're trying to do is 
take an older looking or relatively older 50 year old and by the time they're 70 you'd like them to look like a relatively younger 70 year old another way of saying that is an old 50 year old relatively old 50 year old looks like a young 70 year old and is there an intervention that you can do that would move the person from this trajectory to this trajectory not everybody wants to wait 20 years to know if their intervention will work uh, or at least is promising enough to bring it to uh, market. So here's a, a set of, here's a study from uh, Mike Snyder's lab at UCSF. He's a geneticist, but has taken an interest in aging and um, actually taken an interest in a lot of things. But here's, a, here's an interesting uh, observation. Each one of these lines here is one person brought into the, the clinic and the lab to have a set of uh, metabolites assayed, um, some other functions assayed, and some clinical metrics taken, and then an aggregate score uh, developed. So people have, of course, aging, their aging is idiotypic in that if you have uh, 20 metabolites used, they won't all show the same uh, pattern if they are aging at the same apparent rate. They'll show different patterns. But that's why you use the aggregate score, as you know. But what's intriguing here is that these are doctor's visits over a period of two and a half to three years from which you can deduce or derive a rate of aging. Some appear to be aging more quickly. Some appear to be aging more slowly. Uh, some might actually be, for whatever they're doing, improving their relative age uh, over this um, three-year time period. But what's encouraging about this is that in principle, you could be testing an intervention over a two to three year time period. Now that hasn't been demonstrated here. It's just taking what um, Snyder calls agiotypes and analyzing them within a relatively short period of time. So that's encouraging uh, because that's actually the same time frame as to do a study with laboratory mice. So here you go with these interventions and there's some what might be organizing principles. One of them is you have to accept that aging is heterogeneous and that means both at the um, organ, tissue, cell and molecular levels. So you have a challenge there, but fortunately uh, the computers are up to dealing with those challenges and the mathematicians and, and we're all actually capable of understanding these things through some of the dimensional reduction uh, plots. But the other thing is you could bin by phenotype instead of chronological age. And that might actually allow you to amplify your signal. It might allow you to find out if you're doing an intervention that has a strong impact, a moderate impact or no impact. Or you could also look at the other end of the spectrum and ask, are you, these people you don't expect to benefit, but they might. It might skew this curve even farther toward the younger age, or for whatever reason, you might get a deleterious effect. And then again, of course, the question is, do you really get the average uh, shifted very much from the reference to the intervention? So the other thing is you need the appropriate phenotypic assay. So um, there are lots of phenotypic assays out there. Um, lifespan being the one that uh, NIA has supported for the longest period of time. But there are all these tissues, those that you can sample directly or indirectly would be good to access. And you could also ask for what is common or what is unique. So you might be looking at liver, muscle, or white adipose tissue, aging for whatever reason you want to focus on that. And you could find that there are genes upregulated and downregulated in your expression profiles uh, and find that maybe there aren't that many that give you a universal answer uh, for what is aging, what have you done in terms of an intervention using this particular set, but there are other ways of going about it. And you can find um, things that are a common set as it were, uh, that's useful. So the other thing about subpopulations is there is actually evidence for the idea that dividing a population might be beneficial. Uh, and this is uh, from, uh, Mendenhall redrawing some work from Mendenhall. Um, uh, the paper is here. 
And this is a situation where there's a marker for one of the hallmarks of aging. In this case, it's proteostasis, and they have a heat shock protein reporter. And in these senorhabditis uh, that's used here, some have a brighter uh, display and some have uh, a lower display of this heat shock protein uh, reporter at baseline. So it's not induced, it's just what do they bring you endogenously. And then if you separate this population from this, you find that those that have the higher level of this heat shock protein uh, reporter will age better. That is, they have longer lifespans and those that have a lower level have shorter lifespans. So in principle, segregating populations can um, be quite informative. The other question, of course, is when you're testing interventions, the granularity. So this is a uh, loss of proteostasis is one of the hallmarks of aging. And the loss of pr the proteostasis underlying that occurs in uh, organelles. Uh, autophagy is involved, uh, ATP me mediated um, protein degradation, uh, all sorts of things that go into it at various organelle levels. And you can actually assay organellar function microscopically, and you can see differences in uh, the quality of the proteostasis mechanism at the level of organelles. Or you could look at the very complex network that's underlying proteostasis. And you could ask, um, if not gene by gene, node by node uh, in this network, uh, using those as an assay if you had a reporter uh, for a specific part of the network. So this whole spectrum is available in terms of um, what would be a useful phenotypic assay. So then we get to rejuvenation, and this is uh, this is great stuff. <laughs> I yes. So um, you heard a talk by Irina Conboy, who was uh, really uh, Irina and Mike when they were in Tom Rando's lab, as she pointed out, uh, along with uh, other collaborators, really got the ball rolling on this. Although the methodology has been around for more than a hundred years, um, it it's. Um, it's a, it's a method where they actually used an injury repair model. But in other situations uh, where it's not an injury repair model, people have also shown that when you can join um, a young mouse and an old mouse, that some of the features of the young mouse can appear to rejuvenate the old mouse. And contrary, some of the, something in the old mouse passed through the circulation to the young mouse seems to produce accelerated aging. And of course, the question immediately is, what is doing that? Uh, and there were some various uh, suggestions and various ways of going about finding out what it is that's uh, moved through the circulation. And uh, you can also do, as Arena has uh, developed, uh, heterochronic blood exchange. That's what this letter, these letters stand for, heterochronic parabiosis and heterochronic blood exchange where here you can do all sorts of things to one of the mice and then take the blood and transfer it, thinking that, well, exercise uh, improves all sorts of things, cognitive function uh, and so on. And in fact, Saul Vieta's group at UCSF did uh, an experiment where they found that um, uh, an enzyme with a long name involved in uh, glycolipid metabolism uh, is elevated in exercise in the young mouse. And when that is given to the old mouse actually helps with uh, cognitive function in the older mouse. It's a very nice study, but we also know that the, uh, caloric restriction has all sorts of effects. Uh, you could even take blood at different times of day where uh, the circadian rhythms seem to have an impact. And where the circadian rhythm is dysregulated, you may see accelerated aging. You can also do deleterious exposures and find out how, if that is something that's transferred through the blood, chemical interventions, genetic modifications, all sorts of things are available. Of course, uh, this has more options open because there's a limit to how much uh, an old mouse can survive surgery. So there are lots of ways of going about this, but one of the things that you can ask in this and other experimental paradigms about rejuvenation, what is necessary and sufficient to turn back the hands of time? That's a tough question. So there's more fibrosis, and sometimes you see that fibrosis is resolved in one of these experiments, or if it's not necessarily resolved, maybe there's less of it, depends on the time frame. 
Uh, is the epigenome reprogrammed, something that Tom Rando is working on? Is DNA repaired? So DNA damage is a driver of aging. So if you've rejuvenated, is the DNA now repaired? Damage is a driver of aging um, in a, multiple compartments, uh, uh, molecular compartments. Has that damage now been removed or repaired in, as part of the rejuvenation? Is complexity restored? Now, uh, this question comes actually following the work of Lewis Lipsitz uh, in Boston. And he looks at cardiac, he has looked at cardiac function along with the uh, gait and, and uh, range of things in uh, older uh, humans. And if you look at uh, an electron uh, cardiogram of a young, healthy adult, you'll see a very complex uh, set of signals that come out of it. And if you look at an older person, much older person, a lot of that complexity uh, has gone away uh, for a range of uh, physiological reasons, probably partly from uh, increased stiffness in the heart or, or uh, problems with uh, electrical conduction. But be that as it may, his observation is that there's less complexity with age, uh, maybe more noise, but uh, less complexity in his view. So is complexity restored? Has the heterogeneity be re been reconfigured? We know from looking at single nucleotide and single cell uh, RNA profiles that the cells are quite heterogeneous and you can find subsets of cells that are more or less in a particular class with age that may be linked to some of these aging phenotypes. Or maybe that's all still there, but there's an increased tolerance for it. And so the system is buffered against um, the inefficiency of every enzyme catalyzed reaction. DNA repair is not 100% efficient, but maybe for whatever reason, there's more tolerance for it. Aberrant messages might be cleared better. Alternative splicing or spliceosomes might suddenly be more efficient in producing uh, the protein intended from the transcription of the DNA. So let's go back to this uh, problem of undulating waves of protein with age. And let's actually do a little thought experiment. Let's say that we try to superimpose the um, waves of plasma proteins. Now, again, this is humans, but you can expect, I suppose, the same thing in mice. And let's look at what was done in terms of the heterochronic parabiosis. The standard model is a mouse that's 24, that's the young, and 20 months, that's the old. This will tolerate the sutures and the conjoining. Of course, the mice are different sizes and different capacities. So you have to have some reserve capacity. But if you map this age relative to, let's say, a human age, so mouse might be 38 months and a person 90 years. Um, so here's, here's where you are. Uh, if, if you make this analogy to the prevalence of disease, now it's not an exact analogy, but bear with me, please. Um, so the question is, did we just, we, <laughs> the people who do the research, just get lucky? And so they found that these aging phenotypes were moved, even though you might be in an area where there aren't that many aged phenotypes to deal with, or could you in some fashion, perhaps in heterochronic blood exchange, ask what would you take, what would happen if you took this kind of mouse? That is the expression profile here is different from the four month old mouse. It's still before the advent of um, the disease states, but it's earlier and with a different uh, blood profile from the 20 month old mouse, or even more so a 30 month old mouse where probably a lot of this stuff has happened. So we know that um, the diseases themselves affect the aging profile or the rate of aging. Maybe this has some information in it as well that's different from the standard format and might also be different from this format. So of course, you know, it's easy for me to say, I'm not running a lab, I can ask anybody to do anything and they don't have to pay any attention, um, but, it's an interesting question. Uh, have we just by gotten lucky with this uh, experimental paradigm? And is there more to it uh, that we have not yet um, leveraged? And of course you could take another, uh, an yet another intermediate state where there's some more disease, but it's not probably quite as bad as uh, later aged mouse. But this 
for technical reasons, of course, might be better done through the blood exchange than the parabiosis. So let me just go briefly through a few more things. I asked about fibrosis before. Uh, here's a study from um, uh, Henry Jasper's lab. Um, so uh, he, he's look, he has a candidate factor, MANF, which is um, mesencephalic astrocyte derived neurotropic factor. And it seems to have an effect on cell death by, as an inhibitor. So uh, he's testing this, and this actually was supported by uh, money that we gave to the lab as an award um, on a request for support for heterochronic parabiosis. And he worked with Sol Vieta to do the actual experiments. And so if you join together, the, of course, there's the controls without the conjoining. So there's the, the old isochronic parabion, and then there's the young and the old, and you see that there's some uh, rejuvenation and less fibrosis. And if you do the MANF heterozygote, so the level is much lower, or at least half lower, uh, it's more like the old mouse uh, in the uh, heterochronic, in the parabiosis paradigm. So what's laid out here is a way of analyzing this because you have the genetic, uh, the genotype has been altered at least in one gene. So if you look at all liver genes affected by aging, that's a young versus an old without the conjoining. That's this set. Then you have those that are rejuvenated by the heterochronic parabiosis. And that's um, this liver gene expression profile. Sorry, these are gene expression data um, relative to this pair. And so that's this subset of those affected in the liver by old versus young. So here's your pool from which you would expect the rejuvenation to be significant. And then the genes that still change in the MANF heterozygote, those can be considered relatively independent of um, MANF because you've reduced the signal from MANF. So then you have a set, a, a smaller set of genes to work with, and those genes provide clues as to the mechanism by which the fibrosis is reduced or whatever other phenotypes you're looking for in the liver. So that's all about proteins. And as Tony Muscori says, they look at proteins because it's convenient. It's, it's something for which they have the technology. But here's something from the Ben Altman lab in an injury repair model. The previous one was just aging, not injury repair. So here's a fracture. In, we know that fractures in older people and older uh, mammals in general, um, uh, they, they heal not as well. And so um, Allman showed that there are macrophages that uh, move into the fracture area and they affect progenitor differentiation. So they affect a cell fate decision to become either fibroblastic or osteogenic. And um, interestingly enough, using uh, gene expression profiles and some clues as to the uh, molecular nature of these macrophages, which come and go. They appear in the wound site, have their effect and depart. Um, and they come from the young mouse and are moved into the old mouse through the circulation. So he's been able to identify, but not publish, which are those macrophages, what is their level relative in age, and what are their uh, actual characteristics and their uh, organ of origin and also their developmental origin. So I'm just showing the Tisney plots as, an, as a give you the flavor of the kind of thing he did, although this is differences between normal and tumor and comes from an entirely unrelated study. It's just to illustrate this is a way of looking at complexity with which you're all familiar and which Allman has used in what I hope will be published soon. But Allman also did this other thing. So when you're dealing with rejuvenating in an acute situation, you might expect that timing is important. So we know if you're going to do a chemical intervention, a pharmacological intervention after a heart attack, the sooner you get to the patient and give them the appropriate um, pharmaceuticals, the better off the patient will be. On the other hand, work done in Germany by Alex Thier and, and colleagues, where they made the same assumption about trying to do a cell therapy uncovered the interesting observation that if you actually wait a bit longer before you try to extract cells to use cell therapy to treat the heart attack patient, 
you're going to get a better result because what's happened is the injury has signaled to the bone marrow compartment and the cells there are responding to that signal. So that takes a few days. So they just came up by being alert, um, which is good science. They found that uh, delaying actually was beneficial in that case. So you could do a two regimen intervention, one with the pharmaceuticals, and then try to get a longer term repair by using uh, cell therapy. I, don't know, I haven't followed that recently, so I don't know how well it's worked out. But here's a situation where the timing for repair is understood in a molecular fashion. Um, this is a wind signaling pathway, as so many things are in injury repair. Uh, and what happens is that there's a, a tendency towards the fibroblast um, state in those progenitors in the older mouse. But if you activate the wind sig uh, signaling pathway, which um, with ligand produced by the macrophage, then you can suppress the fibroblast state and increase the osteoblast state, but you have to get there at the right time. If you wait too long, you will not have the effect. So here's another example of a cellular effector moving through the blood. Uh, this was bone marrow taken or bone marrow cell, uh, cells taken from a young animal, injected then into the bone of an old animal. And what was rejuvenated was cognitive function along with some uh, activity. So the cognitive function was measured as, uh, do these laboratory mice explore as a young mouse would a lot of the cage or as an old mouse would um, either just the old mouse or getting old bone marrow as a control, they tend to stay around the periphery but if you give them the young bone marrow cells, then you rejuvenate the young phenotypes. So there's a phenotypic screen uh, that could be used um, as well. So we just did another uh, request for applications um, for heterochronic blood exchange. And uh, we're going to make nine awards from this. I'm very pleased with this. It's our second round of such a, a request for applications. Unfortunately, the awards haven't gone out at this point. Um, we are a bureaucracy and we are slow, unfortunately, but the money will get out there. Were those awards made, I could tell you who got them and for what, but if you go to reporter in another three months, you'll be able to see for yourself, selves, uh, who got it and for what processes, but just in general, what's intriguing about this set of applications and awards is that they are uncovering the origins of factors that will uh, be anti-geronic, that is, they will be rejuvenating. And they come from all over the body and affect all sorts of tissues. They affect cognitive function, they affect uh, the blood-brain barrier, they affect the uh, brain vasculature, they affect the body, the peripheral vasculature, they uh, come from bone, they have targets in bone, they come from muscle and have targets in muscle. It's actually remarkable what it, this kind of experimental paradigm is able to do. And I hope you are all suitably impressed with Irina's presentation um, because the, her impact on the field is tremendous. So in summary, um, some of the things that kind of bother me are um, we have yet to really identify a rate of aging. We have lots of tools out there. We have lots of things that are useful and being applied. And as long as we understand that they are being refined uh, as we go along, that's very good. Um, there's no reason to pause, put a pause button in any of this. All of this work on rate of aging and, and linear clocks, nonlinear clocks, all sorts of clocks, that really needs to go forward because as in all things in science, it's, it's testing whether the hypothesis is supported by the data. But it's also useful to stratify research populations. And I think that's really, um, it's happening. It, it's time has come, if you pardon the phrase. Uh, and it's, it's not that new, but um, it, it could be emphasized a bit more. And it's also, I think, useful to think in terms of health expectancy. Uh, based on what is health span, health expectancy might be a little more hopeful, if nothing else. And we actually do know that um, how you feel about your condition does have an impact on your treatment. And it's not just the placebo effect. It's actually... Um, the epidemiological data and the social uh, researchers, I think have some pretty compelling evidence that uh, that is the case. Um, 
And also you can leverage subpopulations to screen and validate interventions. That's probably not the worst thing to do. Um, also in terms of these various displays, uh, we know how to visualize aging better now than we did five years ago, but we also have available a lot of the actual visualization techniques through uh, microscopies of various sorts. And it is possible to train um, visualization techniques to look at, the, to identify differences in aging. And I heard about this some years ago at a QB3 presentation, um, and it's being done, and uh, NI is supporting some studies in this direction. And of course, you have to embrace heterogeneity. You don't have a choice because it's there. So um, I would just like to put in a plug, if I may, for the Nathan Shock Centers. We renewed this program. It's been going on, I don't know, 30 years, perhaps, maybe 25. Um, we have some new Nathan Shock Centers now. We managed to add two to the six that were there. Uh, there are multiple labs. They cover multiple topics in the biology of aging. Um, they have all sorts of things now, uh, imaging, bulk and single cell height, all sorts of great technology that's out there. Um, they work with uh, laboratory animals, human populations, human materials. Uh, they have a lot of technology uh, and I'm sure that uh, collaborations could be arranged with them uh, under the appropriate circumstances, either as the shock centers themselves or the investigators um, who are there. And I can say that one of the leading shock centers is at Albert Einstein College of Medicine run by Nir Bajulai. So if you wanted to find out what they are, here are here's the website. Um, Allison has the slide set. You're welcome to it. You can do whatever you want with it, edit it, print it, use it for obscure purposes, whatever you want to. Uh, it's all yours. So uh, thank you very much um, for sticking with me. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much for joining. <laughs> See many real clapping hands here. Um, thank you. Uh, th thank you. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll go immediately to uh, to, to a Q&A. Uh, this was uh, yeah, a, a fantastic array, I think, of, uh, of information. And I think first one up, we have Keith. Yes. Uh, Keith. Firstly, uh, great talk, Ron. Uh, really impressive stuff. Um, I have a, a question regarding the topic of scoring the results of interventions. Uh, you were mentioning earlier how it's easier to you know, physically do things when you're healthier. And we know that exercise itself has a geroprotective effect. So it stands to reason that the, the eventual beneficial effects of a given intervention, say if the end results of TAME is making your biological age five years younger by certain measures, for example, can actually be split into first order and second order causes, right? The, the biological effect of whatever the intervention was. And then maybe if that makes you feel more energized and you exercise more, et cetera, et cetera, that itself will have an effect. So when it comes to trying to rank which interventions are having the most significant first order effects, is there currently any system of how we maybe normalize or, or tease out these two potentially compounding component? Uh, by normalizing based on mobility changes or anything like that? Does the question make sense? Yes, it does. Um, yeah. That's the sort of question that a, a trialist would be better at answering. Um, but I can speculate a little bit and um, perhaps your other trialists here would correct me if I can call near a trialist. Um, and that is uh, you, can, you, you track uh, what's going on, and you can you can look for the secondary effects if they feed back. They could be treated as confounders of uh, the primary outcome. Um, and there are actually uh, graphical ways of displaying that that um, will tell you if something is uh, significant in terms of relating the intervention to the outcome, or if it's a modifier of the outcome. Gotcha. Um, so near, for example, is, is that kind of analysis happening as part of the planned TAME trial to kind of normalize for the mobility increases and things like that? Well, I, I, I absolutely. Look, a, a third or yeah, 25 percent of the budget is a grant from an NIA to take all those biomarkers and make sense to them, because what we're missing mainly is not having biomarkers, but which one are changing with aging. So we don't have to do phase three trial, right? We can 
look for a few weeks and few months and see if we we're on the right uh, track. And and so yeah, and it's and you're right. It's very uh, you you have to plan it very carefully and do all the uh, regression and linear analysis and everything in order to uh, really understand what's going on. But, but Keith, you raise a really important point because what you would like to get from an intervention, if it's, let's say, a pharmacological as opposed to behavioral intervention, is that the um, intervention, well, okay, from the economic point of view, you might want to keep giving the drug all the time or from the financial point of view. But from the point of view of a person's health or from the social impact of it, you'd like a, a people to be able to do those things better, whether they... Um, need less of the intervention because they're doing the other things that have the uh, beneficial outcome. Um, but that's, that's more of a personal point of view that you'd, you'd like to, like that character in To Kill a Mockingbird that Scout read to all the time at the end, trying to get off of morphine. That's the same concept. Yeah. You wanna have some way of getting the person's independence increased because that also has an effect on-, on Yeah, just, um, just to clarify, you know, uh, societally, it almost doesn't matter. You, you just care about the end result, right? But if, if most of the effect of an intervention happens to be, it makes you feel much more energized and you, you're much yes. more mobile, that will have a limit at some point, <laughs> you know, like, you know, that won't stop aging. Eventually that benefit will run out, right? So we would at some point as scientists, want to understand what's going to have the first order effect as much as possible. And that it might be important to be able to yes. have a system to rank what's happening and which therapy should be prioritized based on that. Right. But, and, and I say this only slightly in a cavalier way is, but it would be good if you could die happy. Yeah. I think, yeah. There's a, don't get me wrong. Do everything. Yeah. You see what I'm He's saying? Is that so the right. results will can be confounded. I think we, yes. have, to, we yes. have to tease this out if we want to get more information. But but the tools, are, but the mathematical tools are there to do that teasing out. Uh, thank you. I um, want to ask you: Do you have to hop off right at the uh, when when the hour strikes? Uh, no. 12? No. Okay. Okay. No. Just just checking. Uh, no, this gives me. Yeah, I don't want to go to my next meeting anyway. <laughs> Oh, well, um, do you have like five minutes more or? No, no, no. I'm, my time is yours. Oh my God. Be careful what you're wishing for. Okay. Then we have Aaron okay. next. And then after Aaron, I'm going to turn off the recording in case people have questions that don't, shouldn't go on the record. Okay. Aaron, you go. <laughs> sure. sure. I'm glad to be the last final recorded question. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Kohansky. Uh, my question is within the NIA, who are the other people that you're working with who are championing this direction of research? And as a bonus question, are there any opponents and people who are trying to stymie this direction of research? We're all in this together. Um, we collaborate quite a lot. Uh, there are four divisions, uh, geriatrics and clinical gerontology, behavioral and social research, and uh, di division of neuroscience. We all work together. We also work with other NIH institutes um, and pretty much every institute now has is paying attention to aging as a parameter. And then there's also an NIH wide uh, approach to including older uh, people in uh, clinical trials and clinical research. So um, as far as opposition, I wouldn't say there's opposition, but there is due caution because uh, when you ask older people to participate, then you're asking a, a group of, not everybody, but some with some cognitive impairment, and then you have serious uh, concerns about ethics um, because of what is informed consent. So I wouldn't say there's any opposition. I'd say, in fact, there's a great deal of enthusiasm across the entire NIH enterprise, um, but it, it's, it's moderated by uh, the necessary caution. 